and welcome to our November Night Sky Explorer program with Astro Bob King. I'm so excited you're here. It's going to be a great time. Let's let's uh, start to dive in. But before we do, a quick uh, intro. This webinar is brought to you by the Voyagers Conservancy, the official nonprofit partner of Voyagers National Park. Voyagers Conservancy helps promote and protect the park by funding conservation and education programs. Our Night Sky Explorer series brings together night sky appreciation and astronomy skills for everyone, even you, even your best friend, even your neighbor down the street, everyone. If you are interested in learning about dark sky present uh, preservation at Voyagers National Park and viewing previous AstroBob webinars, please visit voyagers.org slash dark skies. All right, Astro Bob King fell in love with the night sky as a child and is a passionate educator. He served as a photographer and photo editor at the Duluth News Tribune for 39 years and taught at the UMD Planetarium for many years. Bob has written several stellar books, including The Urban Legends of Space, which explores astronomical science versus pseudoscience. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And here is Astro Bob. Hi, everybody. Good to have you here in this cozy corner on a November evening. I don't know where you're at right now, but I know here it's cold outside, but it feels nice and comfortable inside, especially sharing astronomy as we do each month. And some months we have just a few small things. Other months, like this one, we have kind of a bigger event, I guess, astronomically speaking. Eclipses kind of rank up there as bigger events because they don't happen very often. Usually you get only two eclipses of the moon each year, sometimes zero, and at most three. So we're going to talk about the lunar eclipse. Then we're going to finish up with a comet that you'll be able to see, hopefully be able to see in a pair of binoculars in the first part of December. So feel free, as always, to ask questions during the presentations by going down at the bottom of your screen and pressing that little chat button that you see down there. And uh, I can answer during the presentation and also afterwards. With that, I'm going to share my screen. And we'll head over to the presentation, calling it Catch a Lunar Eclipse. Uh, you might catch cold, not get a cold, but you might get a little chilly during the eclipse because it happens this week in November. So dress warmly. Most of the country is going to be pretty chilly. So put on some warm boots, something lined, you know, so that your feet are uh, comfortable. And the more comfortable you are outside, the happier you'll be observing this astronomical event. Before we launch into the eclipse directly, I wanted to remind you to pick up and print out your free star map. Each month there's a free evening sky map, along with on the left side here, a list of events that happen that month that are visible with the naked eye. And that sky map is available as a PDF file that you can print out on your printer at skymaps.com. Here it is, one right here, nice and papery, bring it outside and use it to locate the brighter constellations and planets. I saw the moon the other night. I try to get out most nights. I mean, the moon starts to wax to its gibbous or full phase. It really throws a lot of, uh, throws a lot of light on the landscape. And last night, uh, we had snow, so it was extra bright outside. So I look up at the moon, and when you look up at the moon, just to, to sort of visualize or imagine its size, just picture the United States spread across the moon. From edge to edge, our country's just a little bit bigger or wider than the moon, but not by much. The moon's diameter is 2,160 miles. So imagine the U.S. up there kind of taking up most of the space from one side of the moon to the other. Friday, well, <clears throat> pardon me, the full beaver moon, each moon, each month has its own named moon, often a traditional name from native peoples, colonial times. This month's full moon is called the full beaver moon. It occurs on Friday night, November the 19th. That's when the moon will be opposite the sun in the sky. Here's a diagram showing you the arrangement uh, that we'll have Friday. We have the sun off to the right, 
here's the earth in the middle and there's the moon in line with the earth and the sun and when this arrangement happens when these three bodies are all lined up our observer here looks out from his dark place on the planet towards the moon and sees the front face or what we call the near side of the moon fully illuminated so we see a full moon the full moon is always opposite the sun it's not between the earth and the sun it's on the opposite side of the earth from the sun i went down one time to lake superior to the shore to see if i could squeeze uh, the sunset and the full moon rise into the same photo and it didn't work at all as you could see but i almost got there off to the far right you could see the sun remember the diagram from before okay where the sun was off to the right and here we are on the earth of course it looks flat the planet does because we're standing on it and it's such an enormous sphere compared to our size that we perceive it as a very flat surface got to get up in space to see it as a sphere and then on the other side of the earth is the moon the full moon rising one more way to look at the situation to sort of swing around in space to put the sun here in the foreground at the bottom here we see the sun's light streaming past the earth there's our observer that's you the little blue person there looking out towards the moon notice that the sunlight streams past the earth and it illuminates the full front face of the moon when the three bodies are all lined up in a row. Notice something else though, there's a shadow that the earth casts. So if the earth is casting a shadow into space and the moon at full moon is in line, then why don't we see an eclipse of the moon when the moon moves into earth's shadow every single full moon? Very simple answer to that question. The moon's orbit is tilted. So tilted about five degrees to the plane of the Earth's orbit. So as it swings around the Earth and it approaches that spot where it might get into the Earth's shadow, usually it goes a little bit above it and misses the shadow, or it goes a little bit below it and it misses the shadow. But just a couple of times a year, the lineup is exact or nearly exact, and we get either a partial eclipse or when it's even more precise we get a total lunar eclipse so a couple of years we have an exact lineup this is the second time this year that we'll have an eclipse of the moon the first time was back in may that was a total eclipse this eclipse is almost total it's super super close to total so virtually the same Here's how it works. There's the sun. I'm, I, I apologize for flipping the sun around on you guys. <laughs> One slide, it's on this side. Here, it's on that side. But it's not the position that matters. It's just the alignment that matters. So here we have the sun on the left and the earth in the middle again and the moon opposite the sun on the other side of the earth. And here, the lineup is exact or nearly so. So the sun's rays stream past the earth and create two shadows first we'll look at the shadows then we'll look at this color the outer shadow of the earth is called the penumbra and the inner shadow of the earth is the umbra in the penumbra the globe of the earth does not quite block all of the sun as seen by an astronaut on the moon a little bit of the sun pokes off to one side of the earth i'll show you what that looks like in just a moment when the moon moves into the umbra, the inner shadow, the globe of the planet completely blocks the sun from view. So that's why the umbra is shown here so much darker. When the moon goes through the penumbra, and it does that during penumbra, sometimes there's just penumbra eclipses where it just clips the outer shadow. You can barely see that shadow because it's a mix of sunlight and a little bit of shade thrown by the planet. So it's not a really dark shadow. But as soon as the Earth treads into the umbra, as it, or pardon me, as the moon treads into the umbra as it's orbiting the Earth, that's a dark shadow. So it takes kind of a bite out of the moon right away. And you can see it immediately. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to tell you about the color. Take a look. 
if the earth had no atmosphere and the sun stream passed it, there would still be a shadow. But the moon would move into the umbra, the inner shadow, and it would be completely black. But because the earth is surrounded by air, very thin layer of air, that air acts like a lens or a prism, and it bends the incoming sunlight. I tried to show that here at these little points. It bends the sunlight into the umbra. Not all of a sudden. Remember, the earth's still hiding the sun, but sunlight is bent by the atmosphere. All of the other colors are scattered away, the blues and the greens and the bright yellows. And the only light that makes it through when it's bent by the air are the oranges and the reds. And those colors seep into the umbra. They go right into the umbra. And when the moon moves into it, instead of being pitch black, it's actually a beautiful hue of deep yellow, bright orange, reddish orange, deep red. The color varies depending upon the state of the atmosphere. If the atmosphere around the edge of the earth where the sunlight streaming through is really transparent, the moon will be brighter in the umbra. If there's a lot of volcanic dust from the recent eruption, that will absorb some of the sunlight and it will be darker when it moves into the umbra. So you never quite know what you're getting. And when you see a bright moon, you can know that the air is fairly clear. If the moon looks dark during the eclipse, then there's something obscuring that air probably volcanic dust, possibly clouds too. This is a picture taken a few years back of a penumbral eclipse. That's what the moon looks like when it's inside the penumbra, close to the umbra. Not there yet, but right in that penumbra. You can see the difference, can't you? This part of the moon is brighter and you can see kind of a, a duller, darker half of the moon. Not a bite, but you can sense that shading. When it moves into the umbra, you get the full eclipse. The moon starts here, full and bright, and then as it slides into the umbra, you see a dark bite, and the bite grows larger and larger and larger until the moon is sort of a crescent, and then the moon finally slips all of it into the umbra. It's got those beautiful colors, and we say it's now in totality or greatest eclipse. Again, our eclipse will not be total, but very, very close. Uh, just to give you the perspective, remember I mentioned if you were an astronaut on the moon, you were looking back towards the earth. When, the, <clears throat> when you're looking back at the earth from the moon and you're still in the penumbra, this is the view, here's the earth. And then you see part of the sun sticking out next to the earth. See how part of the sun is covered by the planet and part still sticks out? So you're partly in shadow, partly in sunlight. So that's why the shadow is so pale in the penumbra. But once you are fully inside that dark core, the earth is a very beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Let me, let me show you up close. The sun's now hidden by the earth and here's the glowing atmosphere that red light streaming through, just the way red light streams through at sunrise and sunset when the sun is right at the horizon. It's the exact same effect. Let's actually pull back now. Let's stand on the moon and watch the eclipse as an astronaut from the moon. When we see a lunar eclipse here on the earth, an astronaut on the moon looks back and sees the earth cover the sun in a solar eclipse. I hope that makes sense. Uh, someday, I really hope NASA, China, Russia, whatever country lands a craft that just focuses on the earth and takes pictures of it every day because eventually it will photograph the earth eclipsing the sun when we have a, a lunar eclipse right here on the earth. Look at that little ring of fire. That's the glowing air. And that glowing air makes the moon orange to us during eclipse, and it also illuminates the landscape for an astronaut to see. Not pale white or sunlight bright, but a subtle tone of orange and red. Where can you see this eclipse? That's probably what you're wondering right now. Great, it's happening. November 19th, Friday morning is when the eclipse occurs, and we'll look at time specifically in a moment, but this is a map showing you where you can see it. 
all the areas that are completely in white here, these areas, if you live anywhere in here, you'll see the whole eclipse. From the moment it enters the penumbra into the umbra, exits the umbra back into the penumbra and out again. You'll see the whole thing. If you are here, anyone living in this dark area, no eclipse would be visible. And then in these gray zones, only part of the eclipse is visible. Right here, not too far from Hawaii, see that little star spot there? That is the place on Earth where you'll see the maximum amount of the moon covered in shadow while it's directly overhead. So right there, you could get in a boat, lay on your back and watch the eclipse right over your head. Someday, someday, I'm going to be in that star. So while this is not a total eclipse, it's a deep partial. That's what it's called. 97% of the moon will be covered at maximum eclipse. Here again is the penumbra. You're now familiar with it. Here's the umbra. Here's the eclipse moon within the umbra. Just a little bit will stick out on the bottom at maximum eclipse. Here's a diagram once again showing you the moon's progress. This is specific now to this eclipse, November 19th, 2021. The moon will come in from the right. The moon comes in from the right or the west and it moves east because the moon moves west to east in its orbit around the earth. So it comes in, touches the penumbra at midnight, central standard time. These are all central standard times, just so that you know. For eastern standard, at an hour. And if you're in the mountain time zone, subtract an hour. So touches the penumbra at midnight. You will be able to see the first penumbral shading before it enters the umbra about 15 minutes before partial eclipse begins. So in other words, at 1 a.m. I hope you'll be out at 1 a.m. I know this is gonna be a tough one because you have to set your alarm for this eclipse. It's gonna be a little cold outside, but I've got a solution for that. So if you wanted to watch the entire eclipse, you probably start around one o'clock in the morning, dally with the moon all the way through mid-eclipse. That occurs at three o'clock in the morning, central time. The moon moves out of the umbra completely by 4.47 a.m. And it leaves the penumbra at 6.06. .06. This eclipse lasts over six hours. So it turns out it is the longest partial eclipse of the moon since February of the year 1440, way back in the 15th century. That was the last time they had one this long. The reason for that is that the moon is at the end of its orbit, the other end of its orbit farthest from the earth. So it's moving more slowly than normal because it's farther from us. It's also smaller than normal compared to the umbra and penumbra. So it takes longer to get through the whole thing. That's why it's such a lengthy eclipse. You can always refer to this, come back to this presentation and check these times, or maybe you just want to take your phone out right now, take a picture of this screen. These are the eclipse phases, we call them by time zone. Eclipses are divided into different phases. First, let me explain the time zones. This is Atlantic Standard Time. There's the familiar Eastern, Central, Mountain, Pacific, Alaska, and Hawaii time. The penumbra, when does it first become visible? That's the first phase of the eclipse. Partial eclipse beginning when it first touches the umbra. Mid eclipse is when it's the best time of the show, right? When most of the moon is covered, partial eclipse ends. And finally, the last sight of the penumbra. And then the moon is back to being bright and full again. So I realize you're not going to spend six hours out there. I'm not going to spend six hours watching the eclipse. I'm kind of tentatively planning to maybe be out at 1 a.m. and stay a little past mid-eclipse, maybe till 3.30. But if you only want to spend a half an hour outside, which is quite reasonable, I would suggest that you plan that half hour, that it's center on maximum eclipse, when that 97% of the moon will be covered up in shadow. And the moon should appear most intensely colorful, colorful during that time. So for the central zone, CST, that's 245 and 315. 
and you can read the other times off here, EST, MST, PST. Obviously, if you live in California and you're watching this eclipse, you're so far west, that it happens, the best part happens, not too far after midnight. Much easier than getting up and setting the alarm, right? But believe me, this will be worthwhile. If it's clear, it's really worth seeing, just because even though we're gonna have more eclipses, and there will be two total eclipses actually in the coming year, 2022, you never know if it's gonna be cloudy for those. So if it's clear for this, take a few minutes and enjoy this amazing alignment that happens not as often as we'd like. The other thing you're gonna see when you're looking at the eclipse is not just the moon you're looking at. Remember, you're gonna take in the full scene. You're gonna watch the change in color. You will also see the sky darken as the moon moves into eclipse. You know how it is when the moon's full and the sky is just flooded with light and you can only see a few stars. Well, gradually the stars are going to come back. The Milky Way will come back and you'll see this especially well if you live in the country, then you'll see the full panoply of stars return. And just our luck, just our great luck, the eclipsed moon will appear right below the Seven Sisters star cluster, right by the Pleiades. So you'll be able to see them with your eye, the little Pleiades, the dipper shaped cluster. And I would strongly encourage you to look at the pair through a pair of binoculars. Enjoy, the moon looks very 3D through a pair of binoculars, by the way, because you can normally never see stars near the moon when it's full because it's just so glary. But with its light quenched, Stars are visible right up to the edge of the moon, and it creates a spectacular 3D effect in binoculars. And colors are more intense, too, in binoculars. And then you can swing up from the moon to the Pleiades and back and forth. I can't wait. Here's another photograph. This was taken during the eclipse a few years ago. It shows the totally eclipsed moon here. It's overexposed, right? I did that so I could record the stars in the Milky Way. Look at that. That is surreal, isn't it? When do you get a picture of the moon with all these stars? Only during a near total or total eclipse. You may want to take a picture of this as well or return to this presentation. This is uh, my eclipse photo guide. It's set for ISO 800 on your camera. ISO 800 is a great speed or sensitivity rating for your camera to record all the different aspects of the eclipse from before it begins when the moon is incredibly bright all the way through near totality and back out again. I've got the ISO here. Here are the F stops or the lens openings that you might use, F2.8, F4, 5, 6, and 8. The smaller the number, the larger the lens opening, more light the lens gathers. So exposures are much shorter at f2.8 than they are at f8. As an example, there's no eclipse. Look at, look at how bright the moon is. At f8, it's a four thousandth of a second. You could handhold that. You can handhold pictures of the eclipse with a telephoto lens all the way until half of it's covered. After that, once you get down to 1 one twenty-fifth, one half, you've got to put your camera on a tripod to keep going. And you'll probably want to open up that lens from eight because the moon gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. You're going to want to open it up to five, six, four, and two, eight. Just check the back of the camera, see what's working for you. If it's not, change the shutter speed on your camera or change the uh, amount of light the lens lets in, what's called the f-stop. Um, we talked a lot about the umbra, and the penumbra. Just to give you an idea, when the moon moves into the umbra, it's actually at the moon's distance, really small little spot in the sky. It's only two and a half times the diameter of the full moon. So two and a half full moons wide. That little dark, that's how small that shadow cone of the earth is as it extends past the planet into space. That's how small it is when you get out to 239,000 miles, the moon's distance. So you can see why an eclipse 
is kind of a rare thing because of that tilt in the moon's orbit. You can see how easy it is for the moon to miss this bullseye. Up oh, goes there, no eclipse. Up oh, goes under, no eclipse. You got to hit the bullseye for the eclipse. Speaking of shadows again, we uh, I'd like you for you to see the Earth's shadow. You'll see it on the moon on Friday morning, November 19th. But if it's clear before Friday morning and you can watch a sunrise or a sunset, I've got sunset illustrated here. You can watch the shadow that our planet casts. Yes, the very shadow that's going out to the moon. You can watch that shadow rise in the eastern sky as the sun is setting in the west. And it's topped by a pink, kind of a pink fuzz, a diffuse light called the belt of Venus, which is really reddened sunlight reflected by the upper atmosphere. So you got this pink belt. And below it, this thick gray band. Let me show you what it looks like standing here on the Earth. Look at that. There's the shadow of the planet. You've probably seen this many times before. Maybe you've realized it's the shadow, maybe not. But this shadow, because we're on the ground, extends like 180 degrees all around us. And it creeps up into the sky as the sun sets and then drops below the western horizon. That's the shadow of the Earth, the shadow that's going to cover the moon. I just want to end tonight's presentation with a few words about a bright comet. Well, at least we hope it's going to be bright. It is brightening steadily all along, uh, as astronomers predict. Comets can be extremely unpredictable, so don't hold me accountable for anything I say about this comet tonight. But the comet I'm referring to is Comet Leonard, discovered by Greg Leonard about a year ago. A uh, little less than a year ago in Tucson at the Mount Lemmon Observatory. It was extremely faint back then. Nobody could see it with their eye through a telescope, only a camera. But it is gradually brightened because it is moving closer to the sun in its orbit and it's also approaching the Earth at the same time. This is a recent picture just taken a couple of days ago through a telescope. And you can see this bright greenish glow, the head of the comet. Inside there is the actual icy bit that uh, is responsible for all of this glowy stuff. Here's the comet's tail. So it's coming along very nicely. Comet Leonard, I hope you can see this okay. This is the inner solar system, kind of a diagram showing you where the planets are. On December the 12th, Comet Leonard will be closest to the Earth. It's not going to hit us there's no worries or anything like that. I mean, it's going to be 21, almost 22 million miles away from our planet. But that's relatively close as comets go. And the comet is approaching the sun. So it's brightening and brightening and brightening. It's predicted to brighten up to what we call magnitude four, although it could go brighter, perhaps as bright as magnitude two. Magnitude two is the brightness of the stars in the Big Dipper. So this would be visible from suburban areas if it gets that bright. Um, I'll be conservative and say that it's probably gonna to top out at magnitude four, which means you'd have to kind of get away from the city to see it. But a fourth magnitude comet is indeed bright enough to see in an ordinary pair of binoculars. You'll see, a like you saw in the photograph, you see a little bright, dense spot, that's the head of the comet, and then a little wisp of a tail, and that should be visible through binoculars. So I made a couple of charts. You can either photograph these or return to them later. Uh, shows the comet's position in early December from the 1st of December through the 10th at around 5.30 a.m. local time. So it doesn't matter what your time zone is, this is where the comet's gonna be on those dates. And your star to watch, your mark in the sky is Arcturus. It's very bright. You can't miss it. It's the only brilliant orange-red star in that part of the sky at that time. And you can find it by following the arc of the Big Dipper's handle. So we, we call it the arc to Arcturus. Just swing off, follow the arc, boom. First bright star you hit, Arcturus. 
Arcturus will be your guide. And from there, hopefully, the comma will be bright enough that you can star hop with your binoculars to find a little fuzzy blob, <laughs> maybe with a tail. I think you'll see a short tail. And this shows it from December the 1st through the 10th. Notice the comet is moving towards the eastern horizon. So it's getting lower each day by degrees. The final three days that we're going to see it here in the northern US, or pretty much the whole country, actually, uh, December 10th, 11th, and 12th. It's getting closer to the Earth, so it's moving more rapidly through the sky, rapidly towards the sun's direction and the horizon. You can even see down here the glow of morning twilight. And I had to advance the time just to bring the comet up high. Remember the last diagram was for 5.30? This is for 6.30, local time, December 10th through the 12th. Cross your fingers, we might have a pretty good comet. Uh, it won't be the spectacle that comet Neowise was last year, but should this comet perform as we anticipate, it will be the brightest comet of the year 2021. And with that, I'll stop my share. And if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Well, Bob, thank you so much. Yeah, if anybody else has questions, um, I'd love to pass them along. If anyone on Facebook Live has questions, I also have that pulled up. I have a question, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Lauren. So with the solar eclipse, we see, um, you know, like wildlife being impacted. Oh, what like in the solar start? eclipse? Yeah, does that happen in a lunar eclipse? That's a fascinating question. I've not heard of any uh, because, no, I just, I have not heard of anything like that. It's a very slow event and it does get dark. The sky will look just the way it does as if the moon wasn't even out, but it is on a slower pace. I think it would affect wildlife in providing, once the moon's in eclipse, it would provide cover for small creatures that owls and other nighttime predators might be looking for. Uh, but I don't know of any specific behavioral changes, Laura. Not that that means there aren't any. I'm just not aware of any changes in animal behavior, but I can imagine the predator-prey relationship would be affected by that huge change in the brightness of the moonlight. Oh my gosh, that is... Once again, pretty much the coolest thing. <laughs> I, I think it's worth, you know what? I think you should begin a study of this. <laughs> Starting with, uh, eclipse, this coming eclipse. And it also, I would think, just to continue the discussion, it, it would depend upon the season, perhaps, too. Mm. Uh, in November, December, when there's really not a lot moving except, you know, hunting at night, uh, less effect. Perhaps there's more effect when there are more creatures out in the summer months and we experience a total lunar eclipse, but I don't know. I love questions like that, though. Well, fascinating. We will maybe, if, if anybody out there uh, notices anything in their owl or squirrel or small creature um, happenstances, uh, let us know. We'll do some citizen science. All right. Sounds great. Fantastic. Well, I'm not seeing any any questions come up, so I think we'll uh, we'll all get our preparations. We'll get our f stops and our our cozy jackets uh, ready for the eclipse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a and, and remember, you can take the eclipse any way you wish. You can just look out the window at it. The moon will be high up. Uh, in the southwestern sky during the eclipse. So you'll just turn around, look up and go, oh, there it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Spend a half an hour, or you can go out there and take more time, maybe bring your tripod, frame a scene, a, a favorite scene with the moon, a little bit of a time exposure. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to enjoy it. And I hope you all have clear skies. Excellent. All right, well, with that, um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for yet another truly amazing Night Sky Explorer program with Astro Bob. Uh, be on the lookout for next month's program. And if you want to um, learn more about the night skies or see previous uh, recordings of Astro Bob's uh, 
Night Sky Explorer series, head on over to voyagers.org slash dark skies. And with that, everybody stay warm and have a great evening. Enjoy the eclipse. See you all.